And I want to officially welcome everyone, of course, especially today's speaker, Dr. Eva Anagnostulautides and our expert, um, Professor Dr. Uh, Johannes Haubold. I think I said Professor Dr. Eva Anagnostulautides as well. Sorry for that. Um, before I start, I want to drop one note. I'm wearing an orange T-shirt today. It's the Thrive T-shirt that our university gave out years ago, long before the pandemic struck and anyone thought of things uh, like that to happen to us. And I embraced it years ago because I think that mental health wellness or mental health issues are not uh, things or problems that concern individuals. I think it concerns our whole society. And the very important thing is to open up about these uh, matters, to encourage all of us to, to share our concerns and sometimes to share the darkness that we have. Not, of course, with such a broad audience. That is not my point. Rather, the encouragement to, to find friends, uh, to, to entrust your, uh, your problems to, to speak about it. That is something I would like to share today. And I will just come my thanks to the whole group because um, for all of us, the last year, the last years have not been easy, but um, reuniting with friends and making new friends and having these many friendly exchanges has brought a lot of light uh, into my life uh, recently. So thanks to all of you for that, especially to my friend and co-host, um, Dr. Ben Skolnick. Now, um, I'd like to introduce uh, our speaker a little bit more. Um, Professor Dr. Eva Anagnostu Lautides, a very long name, I have to say. Uh, I say Eva from uh, here on, which is much easier, uh, is uh, a prof uh, associate professor at Macquarie University in Sydney. And she gained her PhD, um, or she studied, and uh, I have to say, she studied at Aristotle University in Thessaloniki. Uh, and further went on with her studies um, in, at Leeds and Kent. Um, and uh, she previously held a position at Monash University, which I think is in Melbourne. And uh, I think you are also home officing from Melbourne today, or rather I should say tonight, because my first thanks to Eva um, is uh, for her heroism. It's uh, it's 2 a.m. in the morning, and when I offered her to adjust uh, the presentation time, she said, no, you might lose participants, and uh, I can do it. So thank you very much indeed uh, for this. Now, Eva, um, I looked into your publication list to give a somewhat broader presentation of your work, and I am amazed by the breadth going from uh, well, the, the classical period into late antiquity. A lot of philosophy is there, um, a lot of Christianity, and many, many digressions into no matter what. And what I really took note of is your interest in drinking. So you have uh, at least half a dozen of papers on the drinking culture of antiquity, and I felt ever more sorry that I did not make it in person to the Seleucid conference to which you invited me two years ago. So I miss all of that part, and I very much look forward to us having other opportunities to soon coming together in person and also exploring the symposiastic sides uh, of things. Now, we have you in today because uh, you have not uh, developed a recent, not only developed a recent interest in the Seleucids and their ideologies, but you do that with a specific focus on the Akkadian and the Near Eastern um, roots, um, often hidden to us uh, from our Eurocentric or uh, classicist perspectives. So uh, I think many of us, especially in this large and ever-growing group, understand that we we have such a, we would have only a very limited understanding of the Hellenistic monarchies, especially of the Seleucids, without exploring ever further their Babylonian and Persian and further um, uh, Near Eastern roots. Um, so that is the one big point uh, of uh, the paper you are going to present. And the other is 
that yeah, many of us, we have had our doubts about the stories told about the Seleucid anchor, where it allegedly comes from. So Eva is going to share with us very soon uh, an, an attempt at un having a better understanding or a new understanding of where the motif of the Seleucid anchor is, uh, anchor is coming from. Before I leave the floor to her, I would also like to, to, to welcome again and introduce to you uh, Professor Dr. Johannes Haubert, henceforth Johannes, uh, who is a professor at Princeton University. He studied um, in my home country, Germany, um, in, uh, at Freiburg and uh, I think Tübingen, if I uh, have got it right, uh, and further in Cambridge, Cambridge, where also his uh, professional career started. I once had a chance to meet him uh, at Durham University. Uh, and uh, it was in, I think, 2018 or 2019 that he was appointed at Princeton. And uh, Johannes also has an astounding oeuvre. Uh, he is certainly known to every Homerist, uh, but uh, it's not only, well, three books on Homer, um, a massive uh, legacy that this young colleague already has uh, to boast, but uh, it's, he's he is, as Eva, one of the few colleagues in classical studies that also studied Akkadian and actually brought it to the fore of, uh, of his research. So um, a book on Berossos and a book on, uh, on the Greek Babylonian literary influences have induced me to ask him uh, to be our expert today. And I thank you very much for joining us today. Now, the format of our um, of uh, our uh, Seleucid Wednesday um, will be from now on that Eva is going to present. Um, Johannes will give some expert feedback. The two will have a brief exchange on that before we open the floor and there will be ample time for us to ask questions, to share our thoughts, also to, to raise critical questions. Um, and uh, I look forward to all of that and it will be my friend and co-host, uh, Dr. Ben Skolnick, who will take over uh, the, and chair the rest of the session. Now, I hope I haven't forgotten anything. Uh, otherwise, you can, of course, always let me know. Oh, yes, uh, if anyone um, feels the need to, to say something or to communicate something, if there is a technical glitch, either use the raise your hand function, which you find at the bottom of the control panel. If you go to the, it's for most of you, it will be the three dots. No, there it is not. Oops, looks a little bit different today. Oh, it, no, it's the reactions. Oh yeah, it's the, probably the reactions. Oh yeah, yeah, you click, click the reaction uh, function and at the very top of the reaction function, you have the raise hand function. I hope I've covered everything and if I now the floor is yours. Thank you very much Altai for this uh, excellent presentation. I didn't expect it. Thank you Ben for the invitation. Thank you Johannes for taking the trouble to read my work. So let me try with you to explain the anchor, a symbol that remains puzzling, a symbol chosen by Seleucus Nicator to be represented in his coins in 305 BC, the first year of his reign as King of Babylon. Robert Handley in 1974 was the first one to write a full article on the topic, although several numismatists, including Ioannis Voronos in 1904 and Edward Newell in 1938, had already made informed guesses about Seleucus' mysterious choice. I will try to revisit the topic, encouraged by the main methodological shift that has since been applied to the study of the Seleucids, meaning, of course, our attention to the Near Eastern context in which the Seleucids tried to establish their, uh, their empire. For example, among the many advances that have been achieved in this uh, direction, the cylinder of Antiochus stands out, inscribed uh, with a prayer that the king addresses to Nabu in the traditional style of Babylonian kings. In my presentation, I wish to first revisit 
the ancient sources on Seleucus' choice and how they have been incorporated in modern scholarly representations. And then I will uh, turn my attention to the importance of Celtic boats and anchors in the ancient Near East. I want to focus on their metaphorical meaning. Votive boats uh, uh, and anchors have been found across the Eastern Aegean, for example, at the Temple of Hira uh, at Samos, but also at the Temple of Baal in Tiri, a god identified with Zeus and Heracles in the Greek context, but also with Marduk in the Babylonian context. Imagining gods as helmsmen uh, of the ship of state was a metaphor at play in Babylon, where the ships of Marduk and Nabu were led in a splendid procession to their temples during the New Year festival. The Greco-Roman, uh, sorry, the Greco-Macedonian uh, subjects of Seleucus would be familiar with the metaphor of the ship of state from the verses of Archilochus, of Alcaeus, uh, of Theognis, from the dramas of Aeschylus and Sophocles, and of course, from Plato's dialogues. In other words, the anchor advocated Seleucus' royal power and was a meaningful symbol for all of his subjects. According to Hadley, the anchor first appeared on the reverse of the Alexander type coins with Seleucus Nicator minted after 305 at Ecbatana and Susa. Some of the Susa coins bear the image of a Nike holding a wreath above the anchor, like the one that you have on the slide here, pointing to notions of victory, which led Svoronos, echoed by Bosworth, to suggest that Seleucus likely tried to allude to maritime victories he had achieved when he was uh, a Ptolemy's admiral, that is, between 315 to 312 BC. Hadley rejected Zvoronos's suggestion on the basis that the victories allegedly alluded on the coins had occurred many years ago, many years before the coins were struck. More recently, Antella Bernardes also pointed out that at that time, Seleucus was subordinate to Ptolemy, hardly a time that he would wish to uh, allude to on his coins at the time that he was trying to establish his dynasty. Furthermore, as Hadley noted, Seleucus opted again for the anchor at the time uh, after his uh, victory at the Battle of Ipsos in 301 BC. These coins, minted at Seleucia on, uh, Seleucia on the Tigris around 296 to 295 BC, could hardly be linked to Seleucus' earlier naval career. Hadley believed that the anchor was part of Seleucus's propaganda, taking his cues from Appian, and I'm of course referring to Syrian Wars 56, and the dream that Seleucus' mother had were whatever ring, according to which, whatever ring she found, she would give him to carry, and that he should be king at the place where he should lose the ring. She did found uh, a king, uh, sorry, a ring with an anchor engraved on it, and he lost it near the Euphrates. It is said that at a later period, when he was returning to recover Babylon, he stumbled against a stone and that when he caused this stone to be dug up, an anchor was found under it. When the soothsayers were alarmed at this prodigy, thinking that it foretold a delay, Ptolemy, the son of Lagos, who accompanied the expedition, said that an anchor was a sign of safety, not of delay. Therefore, Seleucus became king and he used, to engrave, uh, he used an engraved anchor for his signet ring. We're all familiar, of course, with this uh, passage. To explain the appearance on the anchor, uh, of the anchor on the coins issued after the Battle of Ipsus, Hadley suggested that probably Seleucus was seeking to win the goodwill of Greek merchants, who after 300 must have been reintegrating the commercial network stretching from uh, the Mediterranean eastward through Mesopotamia and Babylonia to Iran and India. The ring engraved with an anchor, also featured in another very familiar text for us, Pompeius Trogus excerpted uh, by Justin, although here the emphasis seems to be on Apollo's divine patronage of Seleucus. And here is, if I can make it work, here is, come on, that the text. 
This time round, his mother, Laudisi, uh, been married to Antio, who's a man of eminence among Philippus's generals, seemed to herself in a dream to have conceived from a union with Apollo, and after becoming pregnant, to have received from him as a reward for her compliance a ring. Uh, the on the stone of which was engraved an anchor and which she was desired to give to the child that she would bring forth. Now, more recently, Antella Bernardes explained the symbol in connection with the victory of Ptolemy and his allies, including Seleucus, against Demetrius and the Antigonids in the Battle of Rhodes uh, in 305 BC. According to him, one thing we can be sure of is that the Battle of Rhodes between the Allies and the Antigonids in 305 was a maritime one. Confirmation that Seleucus's symbol was related to this victory, according to Antella Bernardes, can be found uh, in Demetrius's decision to strike coins bearing um, a Nike alighting on a ship prey. These coins were uh, struck around 300 BC. And this was a way of reminding other successors of his victory over Ptolemy and Salamis in Cyprus in 306. And therefore, he was trying to make a statement about his legitimate claim uh, of royalty as Antigonus's son. Antigonus is dead, but I'm here, I'm his heir, I'm claiming the throne. Yet, as several scholars have already pointed out, one type of Seleucus's early anchor types seemed to continue the coins that Mazeus had already struck in 331 to 328 BC when he was satrap of Babylon. And let me show you some of these coins. Mazeus's lion status featured a walking lion facing left on the reverse and the Baal of Tarsus on the obverse. And you can see that silver coin of uh, Seleucus Nicator here with the lion and those coins from Mazeus from the coin archives. As Joseph and Lorber, and I believe Catherine is in, the, with whom I haven't met personally, is in the audience, so I'm kind of fretting a bit. Uh, as Joseph and Lorber suggested, at Babylon, this Elysian god was likely identified with Marduk, the city's divine patron, whose protection Seleucus was now claiming in his guise as Jus Marduk. Tarsus had important cultural connections with Babylon, having been rebuilt by the Neo Assyrian king Sennacherib, according to one tradition that survives in Eusebius. So the city was built in the image of Babylon. Equally, its native god, Sandas, whose origins go all the way back to the Hittite Empire, has long been worshipped as Sandas Marduk. From a Greek perspective, the identification was also encouraged by the fact that both Baal of Tarsus and Marduk had been identified with Zeus, but also with Heracles. In the Babylonian context, the Greeks saw the father relationship between Zeus and Apollo as the equivalent of that of Marduk, with um, Marduk and Nabu, uh, but also as that of Zeus and Heracles. So it's just this father-son relationship that you see between Marduk and Nabu, Zeus uh, and uh, Heracles, or Zeus and Apollo. The Greeks had identified a number of other local Baals, typically portrayed in art as standing on lions with Heracles. Hence, the Baal of Tiri, Melkart, had been identified with Heracles soon after Alexander's conquest of the city. When Megasthenes compared Nebuchadnezzar II to Heracles, offering thus the Seleucids an influential and lasting model of kingship, he may have been inspired by the tradition that Nebuchadnezzar had also laid siege on Thiri, the city that, would, that was imagined as that of Heracles, Melkart, Marduk. So we can see how Thiri bears a lot of Babylonian influence. Thiri, like Tarsus, was an important center of maritime train, trade, on whose coins Melkart appears already in late 5th or early 4th century BC as writing a hippocamp. Sea symbols such as hippocamps, dolphins, and waves have been found on the coinage of Thiri and Tarsus, and even ship crews in their later Hellenistic coinage. 
although there is no evidence for the use of the anchor on coins before those of Seleucus Nicator, especially in connection with his claim to uh, kingship, we do have numerous votive anchors from the temple of Baal at Tiri. And here I have from Honor Frost some of those uh, images. In this context, the god was understood to lead the city as a barge, a metaphor that is very much at play in the book of Ezekiel, paragraph 27, containing his lament for the city. Given that in the lament, Tiri is described as becoming arrogant and thinking uh, of itself as perfect in beauty, the city's competition with Babylon, which Nebuchadnezzar aspired to make the most beautiful of all cities, is alluded. Therefore, taking start from the cultural connection between Tarshush and Babylon, I propose to examine Marduk's religious profile at Babylon. After all, although Seleucus used the anchor on his coins, it doesn't mean that he was necessarily inspired by other coins only. Ships were apparently part of Sargon's claim to world dominion already at the start of his Akkadian Empire. A royal inscription of Budea of Lagash commemorating the defeat of his enemies and establishing regular offerings to his statue was copied, was copied from a Sargonic royal inscription on a statue in the Ur III or early Old Babylonian period. The inscription refers to ships from Melucha, Magan, and Dilmun that Sargon made tied up alongside the dock of Tan. And I've used here in the slide only the Sumerian text because the Akkadian contains a number of mistakes and the reading is not safe. But certainly in the um, Sumerian text, uh, the king is said to let the ships anchor. The inscription is bilingual, so both in Sumerian and Akkadian. And Budea presents himself as the one who tows the boat, uh, sorry, hang on a minute, who tows the boat of Enlil. Uh, before I move to uh, Gudea as towing the uh, ship of Enlil, I also need to uh, explain that there are more than just this one inscription where kings are presented as bringing ships, the ships of the enemies, uh, at, at anchor. One of these uh, inscriptions, in very similar language to, to the one of Sargon that Budea reuses, is his own son, Manistusu. And here I have given you from the uh, royal inscriptions of early uh, Babylon, of early Mesopotamia, uh, that inscription. Manistusu, the king of the universe, after conquering Anshan and Seri, whom left the ship sail uh, the lower sea. The cities on the far bank of the sea have gathered to fight, but he has conquered them and conquered their cities. He struck down their princes, uh, something, something. The mountains on that on the other side of the lower sea, it has its black colored stones broke out and loaded onto ships and anchored the ships on the quay of a cad. He made his statue and donated it to Enlil. And this is something we also see uh, in the uh, Gudea inscription copied from Sargon. Now, in the uh, Gudea inscription, as I told you before, he presents himself as the one who tows the boat uh, of uh, Enlil. Again, we have multiple examples of kings presented as towing the boat, the boat of uh, a, a god. Um, one of these uh, inscriptions is in uh, Rime 117, where this time round we read, his lady, he arranged there in that's Gudea, he constructed for Nigirsu this time his beloved boat, whose name was having set sail from the lofty quay. And he moved it for him at the Lapis Lazuli quay of Kasura. So you can see that there is, this is not just one example, one inscription, but a number of inscriptions 
that refer to kings bringing enemy ships at anchor and towing uh, ships of gods or bringing divine ships at way. Now, Near Eastern deities, therefore, would typically travel by boat either to fight against their enemies or to travel to their festivals. And I'll discuss such examples now. Ninurta, a hugely popular hero, widely acknowledged as a prototype of the Greek Heracles, is described in the Lugale epic as riding his barge, whose name meant boat issuing of the princely quay. The myth had important political connotations. Upon his return from his adventures, Ninurta, we are told, is entrusted with the kingship of the gods, and therefore he becomes the dispenser of kingship for earthly kings. When Ninurta returns victorious to his father, it is importantly his boatman who addressed the god Enlil, his father, uh, on his behalf, asking him to allow Ninurta to take over the kingship. Ninurta's royal qualities were later transferred to the Assyrian uh, god Ashur and eventually to the Babylonian Marduk. Boats, let me see if I can move my slides. Yes. Boats were also used to transport the god statues at their festivals, as was in the case of Marduk, whose boat symbolizes his victory against Tiamat, representing his seawater adversary and which he typically wrote during the New Year festivities. As Anus has discussed, by turning his vanquished enemy into his vehicle, Marduk established a permanent reminder of his conclusive victory over the powers of chaos that Tiamat represents and the establishment of kingship. He also argues that Marduk's boat in the Babylonian New Year ritual corresponds to the more ancient boat of Ninurta. Ninurta's battles against his enemies in the mountains and Marduk's fight against the primordial forces of Tiamat accord with the ancient Babylonian perception of the world map, which I have here on the slide for you, according to which Babylon stands uh, in the center of the world, which is surrounded by a river. Now, this river, the name is Maratu in Akkadian, uh, in the first millennium, it becomes a synonym of Hamtu, which means sea. By celebrating at the New Year festival Marduk's cosmogonic battle against Tiamat, Babylon's kings, therefore, came to participate in the act. Numerous miniature boats were produced every year for the event, meaning that Marduk's cultic boat could be seen throughout the year and not just on the festival days. Notably, a clay barrel of Nebuchadnezzar II bought in London in 1888 and currently housed at the UK Museum, describes the restoration of the temples of Marduk and Nabu at Babylon and Borsipa, referring to their magnificent state boat. And here is the inscription that reads as follows. I adorned the boat Yudura on which rides the Lord of the Gods Marduk, its front and rear, its upper structure, its sides, its deck, host and dragon with in talents, they really want to tell you how much money they've spent on this. Uh, 700 pieces of marble, lots of gold, shining gold, bright lapis lazuli, and on the surface of the clear Euphrates, I let him shine splendid like the stars in heaven, and I filled it with jewels for the admiration of all the people. I covered the cabin of the boat of the Ganul Canal, the boat of Nabu, and also both sides with 13 talents, 30 minutes of shining gold and costly precious stones. And for the going and coming of the uh, illustrious son Nabu, who at Zagmuk, uh, the beginning of the year, rides in procession into Babylon, I let it shine like the day. When I sent the paper to uh, Johannes and Altai, I hadn't yet recovered that inscription, which says more or less the same. This is Nebuchadnezzar's inscription uh, from the Wadi uh, Brisa, uh, where we read, his pure professional uh, processional ship, I coated its sides, so on and so forth, in view of all the people, I filled it with splendor. So again, it is not 
a one-off example, but a boat that was Nebuchadnezzar took a lot of pride in preparing year after year and telling people about it. Although we know little about ancient Mesopotamian anchors as cultural artifacts, given the unsatisfactory scholarly efforts so far to associate the anchor chosen by Seleucus as his dynastic symbol with events in the Mediterranean, it seems to me that as king of Babylon, Seleucus had firmly set his eyes in the east. In this context, and in emulation of Nebuchadnezzar II, Seleucus was more likely inspired by Near Eastern royal ideology that related the victorious sailing of Marduk to the quay of Babylon after facing the monstrous Tiamat. Marduk's investment with Ninurta's royal uh, qualities, which could further encourage Marduk's association with Heracles from a Greek perspective, also supported this metaphor. Palpable, both in Near Eastern literature, but also on royal inscriptions and during the festivities of the New Year festival. The anchor symbolizes the successful mooring, therefore, of Seleucus's rule under the auspices of Marduk, presented as a cosmic event, like Marduk's victory over Tiamat. Notably, and this is something I also want to share with you, uh, kind of impromptu. It appears that close to the time of his death, Seleucus had dedicated to the temple of Apollo at Delos a silver replica of a tree rim. The dedication has not survived in the archaeological record that is listed in the Delian inventories uh, among the offerings made to the temple of Apollo. Now, There have been some attempts to interpret uh, this dedication as in connection with the many epigrams that we come across in uh, the Palatine Anthology, where sailors or fishermen dedicate the tools of their trade. Uh, so Seleucus, having served as uh, an admiral before, clearly is doing the same. But given the timing of the dedication, again, we come all the way full circle to the original uh, objections of Hadley. He can't be meaning to point to a time that he was the subordinate of, of Ptolemy. Right. Maybe given that the last major battle at the end of his life was that uh, victory at Kuropedion, maybe uh, Seleucus once more is trying to say that he has secured the kingship he has secured the territory under his control. His dynasty is safe. At that time in the Hellenistic period, uh, Callimachus wrote a hymn in which he presents Agamemnon as having dedicated to Artemis the wheel, the, the, the helm of his ship the ship that took him to Troy. Well, maybe this is exactly what Seleucus is doing, but not in a naval capacity. For Seleucus, it's the political meaning that is more important. It is the mooring, the anchoring of his kingship. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, it is 3 a.m. here, so I do apologize if I sleep uh, a bit more than I tend to, uh, but I'm more than happy to take uh, comments and questions. So, Johannes, it would be up to you now. Thanks so much, Eva. That's truly heroic, especially at, at, at three in the morning. Um, I greatly enjoyed your paper, both the written version and the, the one you delivered just now. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thanks to, to Altai and Ben for inviting me to uh, give this response. Um, Eva takes up an important trend in Seleucid studies. Uh, 
towards acknowledging the contribution of non-Greek and especially perhaps Babylonian ideology and ideas to the making of Seleucid kingship. Uh, we can think of Kyle Erickson's work on religious syncretism, Paul Cosmin on Seleucid time management, um, and of course, Eva's own work on um, uh, royal ideology. Um, what is new and important about these studies, I think, um, is that they no longer view the Seleucids as content to perform different roles to different local populations, um, but as engaged in building a coherent discourse of empire that cuts across cultural boundaries. So in Barossa's treatment, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar can mean something to Greek and Iranian audiences as well as Babylonian ones, and Eva now suggests that the mysterious Seleucid anchor, which has of course long been interpreted within a, a, a Greek frame of reference, can also speak to Babylonian audiences. Eva, I think, makes a, a strong case for this proposal. She shows that kings and seafaring, uh, that ships and seafaring were important in Mesopotamian royal ideology since the days of Sargon and Gudea. Uh, late third millennium, and she also shows that the cult of Marduk in particular featured ceremonial boats since at least the mid first millennium, probably um, much longer than that. The Seleucids, for their part, placed a premium premium on ruling the oceans, as we can see, for example, from Patroclus' exploration of the Caspian Sea and the fact that the Eastern Ocean became known as the Seleucus and the Antiochus, um, so Pliny tells us. Those the naval policies in the Persian Gulf, well, those still made uh, an impression and made an impression perhaps specifically in Babylon. Um, Barossus credits Nebuchadnezzar with building a key on the Persian Gulf. Um, as ever, reverse engineering his favorite Babylonian king in a Seleucid mold. A century later, the Chaldean scholar Seleucus of Seleucia took established Babylonian methods of measuring the water levels of the Euphrates downstream, as it were, the Persian Gulf, where he used them to measure the tides of the Indian Ocean with unprecedented precision. The work of Seleucus, it seems to me, can be read as yet another indication that the Seleucid Oceanic pretensions made a mark in Babylon. So I find persuasive Eva's central point that maritime symbolism would have spoken to Babylonian audiences of the uh, early Seleucid period. Now, to what extent we should consider the anchor a specifically Babylonian symbol is of course a different matter and Eva has already um, added a few caveats there. Um, I felt two questions in this connection, one of a sort of fairly basic practical nature, and then one more conceptual, if you like, and so hopefully a bit more interesting. Um, so here's my first question. Um, as I understand it, uh, there is a consensus among scholars that the hooked metal anchor that appears in Seleucid iconography uh, was a Greek invention, and indeed both the word ankura and the image of the hooked anchor is common in fourth uh, century Greek culture. I'm not aware of anything equivalent on the Babylonian side, uh, but this is really my question to Eva. Uh, the dictionaries seem, un seem uncertain on whether Akkadian even had a word for anchor. Von Soden thinks yes, CAD thinks perhaps not. But in any case, the term in question, Aku, is exceedingly rare. Um, and nor can I recall anchors being prominent in Babylonian iconography. It's possible, of course, that the relevant evidence has simply not survived. That is always possible. But the classic texts of the first millennium, which we do have, uh, Gilgamesh, for example, Era, uh, well, they talk about ropes and mooring poles, tafulu, not anchors. And, and, and I noticed, uh, Eva, that in some of the uh, passages that you showed us, um, there is talk of rakasu to bind to to tie yeah. um, rather yeah. than 
as strictly as it were anchor by dropping dropping something in the water. Um, so if the anchor was not uh, an especially familiar symbol in a Babylonian context, um, I, I sort of can't help asking myself why it was chosen to represent the role of the Babylonian king. Um, uh, was that perhaps um, uh, an element of uh, presenting Greek technology um, uh, uh, as, it were, as in some ways um, novel and, and, and superior? Um, that leads me to my second question, which is about what exactly we think is at issue when we look at symbols of royal power in the Seleucid Empire. Um, of course, one can approach uh, one can approach that question by asking who contributed what, as it were. Um, that's perfectly legitimate. Um, but we might also ask who saw what, uh, and ponder uh, the wonderful uh, cultural trump lows, as it were, that pulled together different traditions. Um, and that and that brings me back to the stories that were told about the anchor. In antiquity, and of course, you very helpfully, if I um, summarized them for us. Um, so there's the ring, of course, um, and its special connection with the Euphrates. Then there's the birthmark. Um, perhaps Sir Lucas really did have a birthmark that looked a bit like an anchor, but if he didn't, the story is still useful as a cross cultural hook. Um, there may not be anchors as such in Alam Dimu or, you know, related texts of Babylonian morphoscopy, as Barbara Black calls them. Um, but there are certainly plenty of birthmarks, so Babylonians would at least have appreciated the logic of the story. Then there is the iconographic point to which, Eva, you also drew our attention. Some of the earliest Seleucid coins featuring the anchor echo an earlier coin type struck by the satrap Mazaios. Um, the anchor Puns on an element in those earlier coins, which I gather is interpreted as an Aramaic letter. Um, perhaps someone can help, can help me with that. Um, but in any case, this the visual pun um, on an earlier type naturalizes the anchor for a Babylonian audience who may not otherwise have encountered um, that kind of iconography um, very often. And finally, there is the anchor as a wonderfully ambiguous symbol of world conquest, the Seleucid and the ocean, cosmic order, Marduk and the sea, um, and political stability uh, all at once. Um, so everyone could see in it what their own tradition encouraged them to see. Um, I don't know, Eva, how attractive you find that way of looking at things. Um, but uh, I was just struck uh, reading your paper and now listening to you again today, um, how, uh, how you show really beautifully um, how this symbol that in some ways must have looked strange to, to Babylonians could still make sense to them. Um, Thank you very much, Johannes, for um, this. Um observations which very much coincide with with my way of thinking and my way of uh, second guessing if you want my my argument now with regard to anchors in the Aegean we do know that from early on already by the end of the Bronze Age, we have wooden and particularly stone anchors, often with one hole or two holes if they contain um, wooden grips in the holes to make sure that when they are thrown into the sea, one way or another, uh, they kind of um, get a grip on the bottom. We have lots of Bodhi anchors in uh, a number of temples, Greek temples, such as that of Hira at Samos, where you also have miniature uh, boats, but also uh, apart from, uh, from Tiri in Byblos, 
in Kition, um, in Karnak, in Egypt. So from that side of the world, although at that early time, obviously you don't have the, uh, the, the iron or lead uh, anchor that you see on the uh, coins of the Seleucids, you have an awful lot of other types of anchors used to, um, to bring ships at halt or boats at halt. Now, in the Near Eastern context, we know of anchors around the uh, island of Bahrain, and they tend to be the, the stone anchors with a hole in the middle, like the ones that we come across at Tiri. In the canals, I think it makes perfect sense in the canals around the Tigris and Euphrates, I think it makes perfect sense for anchors to be different and for, for ropes to be used more rather than anchors per se. Of course, I say that with some hesitation because if they were using some kind of wooden implement uh, that hasn't survived, but at least in the texts, as you pointed out, that doesn't seem to be any word. I haven't found any word that necessarily means anchor. There is a lot of talk about stones. And whenever there is discussion about anchors, you also come across stones next to it. Um, I haven't had the time to look into that to, to, to see if there is any if there is any a point in trying to make a connection between the stones and, and bringing the ships at halt, uh, maybe there isn't. Maybe the stones are there just to fashion statues for the king. Uh, but I don't see that this would be necessarily um, a problem in the sense that as a new dynast, as a new king, Seleucus is entitled to some innovation. And anyway, as you pointed out, the, the letters on top of Mazeus's uh, coin did look like an anchor, certainly to the Greek, the Greco-Macedonian uh, subjects of Seleucus. Um, for someone who celebrates the Akitu and who has lions like those of Mazeus on his coins, to have the extra symbol of the anchor, perhaps, perhaps this symbol is addressed more to the Greek speaking audience than the Babylonian audience. But at any rate, it takes, what I'm trying to say is that it takes a Babylonian notion and transports it back for the Greek audience who can now invest it with their own um, understanding of the ship of state, as it is already familiar to them. Um, what the Greeks don't necessarily have in such a pronounced way is the divine patronage of the king that nevertheless is, we can still glimpse it, in the final uh, hymn of Callimachus that I have here, because in this hymn, Agamemnon clearly implies that Artemis is protecting them on the way to Troy. But it, it isn't, of course, in the same spirit as you see it in the uh, inscriptions uh, honoring uh, Marduk. But I, I can definitely see the similarities. Now, it is in this context that I would also understand the proliferation of uh, traditions about the ring and the birthmark. Not only you have stories about um, special children or children begotten by gods uh, in the ancient Near Eastern context, but for the Greeks, that makes perfect sense. So I don't think that any myth would go very far indeed if they were to uh, record in detail what was the thinking of Seleucus or what was the inspiration of Seleucus at the time. And rarely these things happen in such a clear-cut way. 
I think that having spent a lot of time in the entourage of Alexander, Seleucus and the people around him had enough time to absorb all these images and seamlessly make meaning in their mind. So an anchor would be a symbol that naturally pointed not only to his kingship, not only to the safety of his political entity, but also to his elevated, almost divine status. And he was ready to accept that, but he, obviously he didn't do it in a, and now let me point out how wonderful I've been kind of way. Um, have I? Have, have I given you a reasonable response? Have I left anything unanswered? No, thank you. That that all makes uh, perfect sense. Um, uh, be great to talk more, but I'm I'm conscious that other people will want to chip in. So thank you. Yeah, thank you again. Thank you. Okay. So thank you to both of you. First of all, for that wonderful and clear presentation. The slides were great. Uh, you know, thank you very much, and thank you also, Johannes. Um, I, 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 I'm going to take the prerogative before other people uh, chime in to, to, if I can, to make a few, to say a few things. First of all, um, uh, you know, to say that it's uh, not that naval connection, I think you have to be right. And I think it was Hadley or something, right? You wouldn't want to um, uh, promote something when you were under Ptolemy. Um, but I would also like to say that a ship is not an anchor and a rudder is not an anchor. Um, and there's no anchor in Ezekiel 27. Um, but the points that both of you were just making about what I call the divine connection and the Babylonian connection, right? Um, those are the texts we have. In other words, you're searching for, you know, for, for all sorts of connections, but we have ancient witnesses to the divine connection of the Babylonian. By that I mean, and it's just really what you just said. Um, the birthmark is a divine, a mark of the divine. Um, there are, there's a lot of studies about birthmarks that they were even seen as signs of past lives um, that you had some connection. And that ring thing, you know, just saying, you no, know, you know, I do belong here. It's a legitimacy question because that's what they were all striving for, whether it was Antigonus or Seleucus, you know, who is a legitimate heir to all those ancient Babylonian kings. And somehow that ring, probably a very artificial made up story, um, you know, get, gives us that. Um, so, so just staying with what we have for those ancient witnesses, divine connection, Babylonian connection, I, I think uh, are, are very important. Do you know of a study, um, Erica Reiner, do you know that book, um, your thwarts and pieces, your mooring rope cut, your mooring rope cut. Do you know that study? No, um, but a, I'm writing it down as okay. you speak. Erica Reiner, one of the great experts, and this is from when I used to study Akkadian, um, a wonderful book, a collection of poetry, but I keep thinking about, I mean, it's a great title for a book, right? Your thwarts and pieces, your mooring rope cut, there may be something in there for you. Mooring rope sounds a lot, you're very you know, close to, to anchor. Um, just uh, two other points and I'll be quiet and then if other people can uh, wanna say things. In Hebrew, um, uh, anchor is Magan, and you okay. have in the Magan. text uh, Magan Mountains, li like li Yes, yes, right? yes, yes. And, and so when you when I showed you, I saw that slide of Magan Mountains, it jumped out at me, right? I, I'm yes. sure there's no connection. I'm sure it's a coincidence, but I can't help but mention it anyway. Um, and the last thing I want to say is the Christian connection. That is, this anchor symbol, the anchor symbol becomes the symbol of Christianity way before the cross, right? And there's you, if you look at a cemetery, 100 CE, all the graves have, uh, the Christian graves have anchors, not a cross. Um, yeah, so you're talking about how, you know, what Seleucus is basing on. I'm sort of going in the other way. Did this anchor symbol of Seleucus have an impact and influence on later centuries on Christianity? Because why, why I mean, I can think of one, I'm not, I'm a rabbi, I'm not a Christian expert, but I can think of one verse in Hebrews, I think it's chapter six, where there's an anchor mentioned. And the anchor is hope. You know, like you're, you're saying, you're 
when you talk about an anchor, you're imputing, if that's the right word, metaphors for what anchor means. For them, somehow, anchor was hope. Is that what they got? Are they deriving something from the Seleucid tradition? I, I have no idea. Uh, those are just some rambling thoughts. Thank you very much, Ben. It, you did an excellent job in explaining to Altai why I keep jumping from one topic to the other. Right, because it's all connected. It's my publication strategy. Um, uh, look, um, I will definitely uh, look at uh, that study by Erika Reiner uh, that you mentioned. To my mind, there must be a pre-Hellenistic connection there because the Jewish communities, remember, um, there is Baal just next door to them and he has this fight with the sea god, is it? Yom? Yom, is yes. Yom? Yes. Yom. Yeah. Yes. And again, this is a struggle. This is a fight. It is not, um, there is no mention of an anchor, but you can see that it is after this battle that safety is established and people can um, claim prosperity. Um, so I I'm thinking somewhere at that time, um, the anchor notion came into play. Yes, and thank you to Kathy Lorber. I saw the, quickly the, the message on the screen. I, I will follow it up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So yes, Ben, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think there is something there that I need to keep looking into. Right, okay. Are, are there others that would like to Altai, I can see your hand. Okay. Altai, you're, you're just the only hand we can see. But, but I can't see you. Yeah. You're muted. You're still muted, Altai. Uh, uh. Okay. Sorry for are. that. My mouse pet didn't work well with the unmuting. Um, well, uh, just speaking of the multiple interpretations of the anchor, just one uh, um, well, one idea that I got when you were quoting the Appian passage at the beginning. So Appian explains, well, the anchor as a sign of safety, not delay. Yes. I, yes. Was, musing, I was musing about this addition uh, well, to refute uh, one potentially negative interpretation, uh, where that might come from, um, or well, it's of course, uh, do, uh, or the, the question should actually be, do we have other explicit interpretations um, that uh, might give us uh, a better idea of the discourse, either at the court um, of the Seleucids or rather uh, well, in the reception and often hostile reception, uh, because in uh, Appian has a lot of uh, anti seleucid material in uh, his sources, which shines uh, often through. The one thing that comes to mind, but obviously it may be terribly anachronistic. When I read that uh, phrase that it is, doesn't mean delay, is the episode when Antiochus stumbles in the temple in Babylon, and that is understood as a bad omen. Uh, but but I think, reading the Akkadian more closely, that he he prostrated in worship. He didn't stumble upon the stone. But the Greek sources keep talking about this bad omen that the king had to um, do away with by allowing the extra provisions for the temple of Esagila to be delivered. 
thank you. That's, yeah. that's all. That's all that comes to mind, really. But uh, I, I haven't gone through the um, the text for further incidents or further omens. Does anyone else know of, of any such? You know what I'm talking about? It's that uh, it's in the astronomical diaries, I think, when he stumbles in the temple of, of Marduk, I believe it is. I think it's a I think it's a chronicle fragment. Yeah. Ah, yes, yes, yes. The yes. crown prince, uh, Antiochus as crown prince, yeah, stumbling on the debris of of the Isagila, or or not. It's interesting what you're saying. Yeah. 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 But the, but the Greek sources definitely immediately talk about a, a bad omen. So clearly they are reading everything in search of some kind of divine sign that that supports the kingship. I can see Nicolas. Well, uh, just uh, on the lack of frustration, because I think from the spec himself, there's some notes on that on the website, Levis.org. He says that um, the proper word for that act of frustration is the ver verb shukenu, like this yes. used very often in the astronomical diaries and chronicles. So I, I would indeed say he, he truly fell down, well, or at least according to from a spec whom I do trust. Yeah, the verb, the verb is makatu, yeah? Yes. Yeah. Oh, the, the, the verb is makatu. And uh, I think some, sometimes it also takes uh, the meaning of, you know, acting in, in self-groveling, like, you know, really falling on, upon yourself to, to show respect. Because from the spec says that um, makatu only means pro to prostrate in the Amarna letters. Yes. Uh, and a few other occasions, so. Well, I emailed him about it. Any other questions? Have I convinced you all? Well, necessarily about the else wants to, to, to draw on the expertise that we have here. Uh, I will not uh, let Eva from the hook so early because I have, uh, uh, well, two more uh, comments. Um, at the beginning of your presentation, when you were exploring um, the relation of, uh, of Marduk and, and Nabu and its potential parallels in uh, Tyre with uh, Baal and Melkart, uh, and of course the, the, the Greek, uh, equivalent or near equivalent with Zeus and Apollo. Um, I was musing about this um, as to uh, how relevant, especially the uh, the uh, Phoenician parallel would be for the early evidence, because uh, I, I think the, the earliest coin you showed was uh, from around three, 305. Um, yeah. So um, uh, long before long before um, the, the Battle of Ipsos and uh, uh, Seleucus' arrival uh, in, uh, in the Levant. So, um, well, you didn't put much weight on it, uh, so that's not meant to be as a criticism, but uh, um, just to uh, uh, be mindful of the chronological implications, and I would even extend it to um, the relevance of Apollo I've just written a paper, uh, uh, yet another paper on the uh, epigraphic evidence from Didyma and Miletus and uh, the Apama inscription and the Antiochus inscription from around uh, to, to 99 to 98 BCE. Um, and uh, well, there is the ongoing controversy as to how early the Apolline connection of the Seleucid dynasty actually was. And I think that the trend uh, clearly goes uh, into the direction of dating the sonship of Apollo late. And I, I, I have tried to further endorse that, not that I always go with the trend, 
mostly that's boring and I do the opposite. But um, in this regard, um, I really think, uh, and, and I, uh, yeah, uh, well, and someone uh, endorsing an early date, uh, I don't want to be silent about that, is um, uh, our friend uh, Christoph Nawotka, um, who recently published a detailed ar uh, article arguing for a very early uh, beginning um, of the Milesian connection and uh, also the relevance of Apollo for the dynasty. Um, and uh, I think the evidence is quite consistently clear that Apollo doesn't play a role and very slowly starts playing a role at the very beginning of the third century. But just as the, the oracle god of Miletus and nothing more. So the notion of sonship is, well, it has to wait until Seleucus, I think, is, is dead. And uh, then we have the very strong output of um, the coinage with Apollo sitting on the omphalos, uh, then the new coin imagery that our friend uh, Kyle has, uh, uh, Kyle Erickson has worked so much on. Um, and uh, the lateness of this um, should, well, should also caution us um, in, in such a way as not to put too much emphasis on this Greek or Phoenician uh, uh, mythical Im um, implication, but rather put even more emphasis on the Babylonian connection. And we might then later ask, uh, in, in, well, when Seleucus is returning to the Mediterranean and the more Greek world, uh, that he might be developing his ideology um, coming from Babylon. So just, uh, I just wanted to mention this perspective, although I fully agree with Johannes that the anchor, the image of the anchor uh, itself seems to be Greek and it is clearly an addition um, to the Babylonian uh, tradition, as you also agree. So there is a fusion of uh, traditions and a deliberate choice. It's not just taking over something that has been there in any one tradition, but it's a new shaping of a new um, a dynastic identity at the court of Seleucus, though I think you have convinced uh, most, if not all of us, um, very uh, by, by very strongly drawing on the stateship uh, uh, I ideology. Now, and, and the, I, I hope that uh, what I've just said makes sense and sounds kind of serious. I add one point, which may be complete nonsense, but I had this uh, this spontaneous association when you showed the um, the anchors from Ugarit, which look so completely different. The stone anchors, yes, I know that there were stone anchors, but how often do I see uh, how do I see how they really looked like and how they function? And seeing them, you know what I was reminded of? Of the omphalos, Apollo sitting on the omphalos. Um, it may be complete nonsense because I have not noticed that the omphalus stones uh, have uh, these uh, holes uh, as on the examples you have showed, but well, I don't have the knowledge of uh, all these technicalities and I, I have not, well, explored these things, but it was just a spontaneous idea that I had. And I have to caution myself also given the lateness of this representation. It is, I think, 277, 276, the earliest uh, datable uh, issue uh, of Apollo on the Omphalos under Antiochus I. Um, and yet I wonder whether this might open up yet, up yet another pathway to, to explore the anchor um, motif. Was, was Sorry, I'm not hearing you. There is a glitch. I did not. Could, could you repeat your yes. question? Oh, uh, I could barely hear you, Eva, but yes, I did have my hand up. <laughs> but, yes, please. Yeah, please. thank you. Yeah. Um, well, uh, just, you know, listening to you uh, there and, and also reading the paper, um, you know, made me reflect that. Um, 
the Seleucids and Seleucus in particular, perhaps, um, struck a, a, a sort of an interesting balance between tradition and innovation. And you made me think of this whole business of the anchor made me think to what extent an expectation of innovation was actually also coming from the subject populations and perhaps especially uh, the Babylonians. I mean, the Babylonians knew that Macedonia was his home country, as they say in the in the in the chronicle um, about him returning to to Macedonia, which Paul Cosman discusses. Um, they, you know, in the in the Antiochus cylinder, Antiochus presents not himself but his father as a Macedonian, so um, a, a Westerner as well at one remove. Um, and then you know you get talk of uh, sacrifice ritual activity in the Ionian fashion um, in the in the uh, chronicles, um, the diaries perhaps also. Um, so uh, and 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 of course in a sort of more threatening vein in the Ptolemy three chronicle, you know the um, the Hanians clad in iron who come to invade Babylonia, but these were Macedonian armies essentially. Um, um, in the Third Syrian War. So um, one really wonders um, whether with the anchor and other symbols of a similar kind, um, the, Seleuc the Seleucids were playing both to expectations of continuity and expectations that, you know, things were going to be different and better, perhaps. You know, because these new kings uh, were so powerful, had such um, uh, superior technologies, metal perhaps in particular playing a part, um, the, the, the armies clad in iron that were irresistible. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think we should, this was a very long intervention, sorry, <laughs> but, but I think, um, I'm sort of taking inspiration here for not polarizing the issue into as it were, Babylonian traditionalism versus Greek innovation. Um, but, you know, various uh, interesting amalgams of uh, traditionalist and uh, innovative expectations coming from different uh, subject populations. But wouldn't wouldn't you care more about wouldn't he care so Lucas more about legitimacy and continuity and tradition than and innovation? And there's, there might be the expectation of innovation, but he's trying to say I belong here. This is mine. Um, and doesn't he have to sort of prove um, his worth uh, to to the Babylonians rather than? Showing uh, just he himself is an innovation. His whole rule is an innovation. Does he need more innovation? Well, from my perspective, the way I've seen it work in various cultural contexts, I think it's always a case of back to the future. Okay. So that's the reason why he aspires to Nebuchadnezzar. That's why yep. gradually Nebuchadnezzar becomes more and more prominent in Seleucid uh, propaganda. Um, not because he wants to say that he just comes from there and copies Nebuchadnezzar, but taking his inspiration from a king that is so well recognized and had spread the Babylonian influence all the way to the Mediterranean, with his siege of Tiri, et cetera, et cetera, Seleucus is saying, I am yes. that and even better. And I can yes. make the connection between Babylon and the Mediterranean even more fruitful and more prominent and more successful, I think. Oh, good. Okay. Are there are there other thoughts or comments or responses? I'm, I'm trying to find that note for Nicholas uh, about the stumbling at that I can. 
I, I do remember the poem better now it, um, uh, f that Erica Reiner has that where that quote comes. It's um, it's an elegy for a, for a woman who who had died, and mm -hmm. that she's now a, afloat. Um, I'm sh I'm sure it's accessible, but but at least you have the metaphor of she she doesn't she's not anchored. She's you know she's floating. She she's separated from her husband. Um, I don't. I think it's called a. Uh, somebody has the notes here. A Syrian elegy. Yes. Mm. But at least Thank it's a closer to using the metaphor. Thank you. This is very useful. And with regards to Altai's comment, I have started reading, but I have a long way ahead of me. Um, some interesting archaeological articles that try to compare temples and ships that arguing essentially that temples are anchored ships for gods. And wow. if you compare the architectural layout of, of ships, Nicholas wants to say something, yes, please. Uh, you can see lots of similarities, but I'm very at the very, very beginning of this kind of comparison, which I want to, to go through just for my own uh, peace of mind, rather than to kind of draw any strands for this argument. Terribly. Well, from the Christian side, that makes uh, a lot of sense to me, the nave of uh, many Christian church types. Um, I'm not sure how that relates to a traditional Greek temple seen as the house uh, of the God, which is not actually the, uh, the uh, well, the host of the community of the prayers, but rather limited to the God itself. Um, so that I would be quite interested in hearing if there is more uh, to specifically apply the notion of uh, temple also to um, uh, and ship to, together. And it would make sense on the background of the text you have text you have quoted where it was the God, uh, well, on his way on um, uh, sailing or or shipping. But yeah, Nicholas and Johannes were trying to say something. I was just thinking um, when discussing the temples, something I, I noticed while reading through the literature is that when looking at Seleucid temples, they're not traditional Greek temples in, in any way or form. And it's kind of this the scale of a Mesopotamian basics or central um, Eastern basic or Asian basic structure with Greek elements. So this is, as far as I know, at least something quite unique to the Seleucids and not as not as much in the Ptolemaic kingdom. So I think this would be also so interesting from the perspective of innovation and tradition, how they combine these local temples with Greek elements, and perhaps also, although this is very hypothetical, local gods with Greek gods. Well, it was Van der Speck, wasn't it, who said that the Greeks uh, of the Seleucid times worship Zeus at the temple of Marduk in Babylon, probably. I think, uh, that's, that's possible, but yes. it's just, uh, yeah. I'm in, in Vienna, so I was talking to, about this bit with Professor Michael Jursa, and he's a bit more skeptical, so... Oh. Uh, yeah. Because the syncretism is, of course, very difficult to understand. And there is some recent research being done uh, also here in Vienna um, on late Babylonian priestly literature. So the difference between how the religious elite looked at Babylonian religion and everyday reality. And I think there will be some interesting things coming out from there. Oh, I look very forward. Please email me with some titles if you have them handy. It's uh, at the moment, I think it's um, mainly the research by Dr. Celine de Bourse. Um, but this is still, she's working on this in Jerusalem right now. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll, I'll try to find some titles. It's, it's still very much at the beginning. Thank you. Thank you. Just just on the business of boats and temples, um, the the original boat in the Babylonian imagination, right? The boat that Utnapishti builds to survive the flood. Um, there there have been 
that that's very very carefully put together um, and there seem to be connections between its proportions and, and those of of temples it's it's in any case a representation of the apsu um which is in itself connected to 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 temples um yeah so so that's where i would look um maybe start with andrew george's commentary of of uh, yes on gilgamesh 11 look at lambert and millard on on the, the flood epic Thank you very much. I mean, I've downloaded so many papers by Andrew George from the SOAS website. He must be thinking I'm stalking him or something, but that's how it is. Thank you. Thank you again for the wonderful presentation. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Um, I just want to tell you. Um, about a few upcoming events. Um, our November uh, 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 lecture will be by our friend Kyle Erickson, um, and it's called To the Strongest, The Problem of Establishing and Bequ Bequeathing Authority in the Seleucid Empire. That's November 17th, again, Seleucid Wednesday. And December 15th will be Stephen Harrison from Swansea, Antiochus at Daphne and Xerxes at Sardis, a comparative perspective on the Seleucid vision of empire. And in the future and future months, we're going to be having lectures by, and I can't open my, um, I know Eric Gruen is, oh yes, by Nick Secunda, by, uh, um, by John Cerati, by Eric Gruen, and we would, that will be in the winter in January, February, and March, and we'll be sending out more to that. Again, and, and thank you, Eva, for for especially for the late hour. I don't know how your eyes are open, <laughs> but but that uh, was, that was a that was a wonderful presentation. I hope you get a good night's sleep after this, because we're all on you your side. Thank you very side. much. Uh -huh. okay. Thank you very much. Welcoming. Okay. Very much. Have an early morning leadership training session tomorrow. <laughs> We'll need a lot of coffee for that. No problem with this session. Okay. Good. Thank you very much to everyone Thank again, you. Johannes and Thank Eva, uh, and everyone for joining us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all soon again uh, in a month's time or earlier. Bye. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.